Welcome everyone. Today we have our another new episode and we will discuss on robotic process automations and we have our world famous speaker, Mr. Marshall, uh, Mr. Rob and Mr. Adam. I want to give chance Mr. Marshall first. Uh, well, thank you, uh, Sharif. I think today's topic is robotics. Am I correct? I just yes. want to make sure I'm on the robotic same topic. Yeah. Right. Robotic uh, process of automation. So uh, obviously, uh, the, I'll just lead off with the fact that robotic process automation is is uh, an up and coming opportunity for young people to participate in. And um, it, it is gaining notoriety. A lot of people have concerns about the fact that robotics will and automation will take away jobs, but actually it creates more jobs. Um, and there's an opportunity here for young people to become educated in it and contribute to this process. Uh, obviously, uh, robotic automation has to do with the physical components of robots that operate systems. So a classic example of that is Amazon. Amazon has these robots that send packages from one location to another uh, on their uh, warehouse floor, but there are still people there in the warehouse operating and managing the systems. There are actually still people that are packing uh, boxes uh, in addition to the robots that can pack some of the boxes. Uh, as robotics becomes more advanced, uh, they can take delicate things and put them into the boxes. The robots will do that. That will take away physical labor, but uh, I, um, it's my contention, and, and I'm not sure if the rest of my the panel agrees with me, but uh, it's my contention that it's the mind, the human mind, that is really a value here, not the physical labor per se, and that a physical labor will, will probably be replaced over time with robotic labor. But at the same time, we, we've seen that in Japan. So, for instance, Japanese automa automobile manufacturers use a lot of robotics to do welding, to do uh, uh, manufacturing, processing, and, and fabrication. Fabrication is the process of taking components from other facilities and putting them together to create the final product. So uh, we're seeing that trend now. And as we move forward, we're going to see more of that trend. But again, I think there's always going to be the opportunity for people to use their minds and their engineering skills and their other skills. And it's true that artificial intelligence, AI, can help do it even faster than a human mind might be able to do it. But at the end of the day, we need human judgment because all this technology is not for a robotic world, it's for a human world. So I think that people will have an opportunity, will hopefully improve the quality of life and not use it for the detriment of others. So that's my uh, opening statement today, Sharif. Thank you, Mr. Marshall. Mr. Rob, what do you want to add for robotic process automation with some industrial experience? Sure. The, the um, issues with robotic process automation really come down to uh, the level of technology you're willing to deploy, um, how, um, how automated the lines are going to be, and the, and the overall effect effectiveness of your quality control pro program that keeps everything in order. Uh, the, the, um, an example of, of initially doing robot process automation wrong um, would be back when I was at IBM, we had, a, uh, I had an automated line. And the, uh, uh, this is back in the 80s, so it did, we, automation, of course, goes back decades. Uh, the, the, um, and 100% of the products coming off the line had fa failed. Uh, the um, analysis of the line I showcased the quality control checks, checked whatever had, had just been done, but the only thorough check of the entire system was done at the end when the product came off. And what turned out happening is one of the intermediate processes uh, broke something else uh, when it was done. And, the, and so while that process checked out as, uh, as working, uh, you didn't catch the fact that it had broken something else until the product came out the back end uh, and it failed. And it was cheaper to discard these pieces of equipment than it was to repair them. Uh, so we ended up having warehouses full of unsellable uh, hardware before somebody finally stopped the line and said, yeah, let's not do this anymore. Uh, another example would be the Tesla. Uh, when when um, Elon Musk first uh, started up Tesla. It was one of the most automated factories in existence, and Tesla was largely staffed, at least senior staffed, by technology people, not automotive people. Uh, still, for the most part, is. Um, and, but the uh, the quality of the cars was uh, substandard. 
Um, they built like a tank, could take an accident like nothing else. But the but the quality was low, and it was considering uh, uh, their highest complaint level was the uh, the fact that parts were often falling off the car when the thing was done. And that showcased that if you're going to build something, you really need people that are expertise on building that thing uh, in the process to assure quality. So when Jaguar did something very similar, uh, they hired a bunch of people from Mercedes Benz uh, from their plants to run the new Jaguar plants because they recognized that they didn't understand the technology as well. And the end result, at least initially, was far higher quality. I'd argue their quality is still high, but the quality has, has seemed to go down uh, over over the years. But in, in uh, 20, uh, 2010 to 2014, the quality spiked, which is when they implemented that program after Tata bought the, uh, bought the environment. And then finally, recently, we've, we've made some pretty big uh, advances in terms of uh, robotics. Uh, the BMW plant, uh, for instance, the new BMW plant is highly automated, including the robots, the autonomous robots that move materials between station to station. Uh, that was created using one of the first instances of the metaverse um, using uh, NVIDIA's Omniverse tool, and they, and they were able to fully uh, create a full digital twin or potential digital twin of the factory uh, before they built the factory, did all the testing and simulation in the digital twin, and then built the factory from that. So in a way, the factory was a physical twin of the digital twin since the digital twin preceded it. And at least as, at least initially, uh, the testing seems to be going very well. I don't believe the factory is actually up and working yet, but the, but the uh, they're going very well. Uh, and then finally, one of the most interesting things you can see if you ever get a chance to see it is is a factory that's highly, highly automated. I went to the... the um, uh, Lenovo factory in China, of course, long before current difficulties, uh, and they had a fully automated warehouse. And and um, and if you were ever into trains, it's the damnedest thing you've ever seen. It's it's like a a three dimensional elevator where the where the pallets would move on a large robotic uh, conveyor arm, which could move up, down, side to side, and side to side, all all three um, all three and back and forth, all all four dimensions, all three dimensions, and the um, uh, and the end result is you just see this stuff going over, picking up stuff off shelves, running around the floor. And of course, if, if any human was on that floor, they would be mowed down fast uh, because it, it was um, it's an isolated machine, fully automated, like a kind of like a part of a big printer. And the and the um, uh, the end result is is people could not uh, interoperate with those machines. That that was one of the instances, one of the problems that we, we the industry has been working to correct with the latest round of autonomous. Uh, machines and autonomous factories is that the uh, the machines can actually recognize the people. Some of the first uh, highly automated systems I've seen, uh, people had to stay well away from them. Uh, the um, the storage array that that would uh, pull and replace uh, tapes years ago was called a Cuisinart because if somebody was inside it, it, it would it would cut them up. So the, so the uh, so this move to create these lines that are far more people safe. Uh, has been very big uh, recently, and the, and then using, of course, simulation to work out the lines problems and um, and correct them before they're put put into place. Also helps with the uh, human machine interaction and keeps the uh, keeps the system safe. So we're moving into an era where a lot of this stuff is not only automated; it's largely autonomous, and and uh, anticipates a time in the future where many of these factories may simply have some uh, a few people doing oversight. And, um, and not very many people inside. In fact, if you look at the big data centers uh, and you consider them kind of a, a storage and retrieval of data as opposed to hard goods, uh, they're managed by very few people, massive sites that are largely automated and electronic, uh, and there are not very many people in them. And we're moving to a time when a lot of the factories are gonna be, gonna be mostly the same. You'll have automated, automated factories building stuff, autonomous trucks delivering it, um, and, um, and in most cases, you'll be buying online. Uh, we, we won't be there fully there for another decade or so, but, but that's the direction the industry is going. Thank you, Professor. Uh, Mr. Adam, what you want to add, even if you had some views, especially how you, uh, the young people, uh, the students community, they can develop their skills in this era and uh, they can contribute for startup development or their career development. Thanks, Shri. <clears throat> um, well, one of the main advantages of uh, robotics and uh, automation and RPA is that we can use them to outsource the most 
repetitive, uh, soul destroying and unfulfilling tasks in the manufacturing process. I think after the uh, assembly line revolution started by pioneers like Henry Ford, the disadvantage of mind numbing and repetitive tasks over and over again was something that uh, was noticed quite early on. I remember watching a, a black and white short film, which I think was from the early 60s or late 50s, and it was a creative and poetic short film based on someone who was on part of the assembly line in a Ford factory in this allocated task. Um, of course, the assembly line had already been in use for several decades by then, but for us it's quite a long time ago. Um, and of course, one of the uh, results caused by ultra-repetitive, inhumanly boring jobs and the morale-lowering effects of that is mistakes. No pride in one's job or in one's work, so uh, it almost becomes a bit harder for the worker to care about their job and wanting to do a good job, even if their role is quite crucial and safety of the vehicle and its occupants depends on them. Uh, yeah, uh, after, after doing the same thing over and over again hundreds of times, mistakes can be made and, uh, and the next person in the assembly line might also feel just as fatigued, if not more, so these errors can slip by and fall through the cracks until the end so it's, it's the opposite of being an, an artisan or a master of one's craft or an expert or like a, a like a kind of smith like a blacksmith or a uh, goldsmith and one of my favorite uh, quotes was from Robert Heinlein a science fiction writer and, uh, specialization uh, is for is for insects um, and I think uh, with the um, the, the normalization of widespread internet use, which has obviously been around for a long time now, uh, we, all, we all, as a society, will know a bit more about um, uh, that humans are uh, multi-talented, multifaceted, and to live a full, um, well-rounded life, we need to do uh, lots of different things and to, have to know about lots of different things, different spheres of human interest and activity, and have practical experience doing lots of different things and I think um, uh, young people uh, also um, have an awareness of that and they use resources on the internet quite wisely and uh, it gives them uh, scope and a horizon and knowledge of what's out there and and I think on centuries of de excuse me, decades of experience they know that uh, for jobs like the previously mentioned the assembly line is quite da quite dangerous for uh, one's enjoy you know life quality of life one's mental health uh, and um, we probably shouldn't go back to that kind of society so hence uh, robotics and automation will be advantageous in that respect and of course yeah we don't want to do we don't want robots and automation to do everything but to do as many of the mind numbing rep ultra repetitive jobs so that uh, life quality can uh, be sustained or get better even. So those are some of my thoughts. Thank you. Uh, Dr. David J. Kelly, there are some questions from audience uh, about robotic process automations. Onika Shamchi want to know is robotic process automation a good career? So what is your... Sure, if that's what you like to do. Uh, I, I cannot hear you. Can you hear me? Oh, it sounds like you got the wrong microphone. Uh, selected. We can we can hear you barely, but the the, the microphone you you have isn't broadcasting, so it's coming from some other microphone. Can you hear me now? No, you probably need to switch to that microphone now. Yeah. Under settings, middle, bottom middle. Oh, I know. It, it's yeah. There you go. We can hear you now. Okay, so what was the question again? Is robotic process automation a good career? And uh... sure, I mean it really depends on what you like to do. If that's something you like to do, uh, I think it's a great career. It's certainly not going to go away anytime soon. Um, it's one of the few jobs that I don't think will be replaced. Uh, it, it just not in the foreseeable future. Um, so yeah, I think it'd be a great career choice. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, like, uh, if you if you share some some views about this question, what are the ben business benefit of robotic process automation? I think she ran a startup. Well, less people involved. 
less people generally, I mean, robotics can get expensive to set up, um, you know, but I'll, it's, it can lower the single mo biggest cost to small businesses right now, and that's labor costs. If you can automate, if you can uh, get your business to respond more efficiently and, and this kind of thing, you're more likely to uh, uh, have a, a lower cost. You might have a, um, a lower cost to market. Uh, I mean, there's all kinds of, of benefits from automation. There are more questions. What features and capabilities are important in RPA technology? Well, uh, IoT, um, artificial intelligence in the broad sense, um, you know, sensor technologies, and that's all built around around a lot of the the IoT. Um, you know, being able to to network and communicate with robotics, and even um, kind of hybrid hybrid automation like you see in in um like amazon factories or i've seen warehouses where you know you have like a hololens and uh, there's a bunch of of uh you know automation but they the human is the one actually picking it up off the shelf but it'll light up the way or they'll see it lit up to what needs to be picked and they stick it on the little robot cart and the robot cart takes it wherever and some other robot you know automation stuff going on and i mean there's there's a lot of there's really i mean it's a pretty broad broad field mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. excellent thank you mr marshall there are many questions from audience low like what are the question you want to respond you can uh, yeah sure uh, uh so uh is robotic process automation a good career uh, what are the business mm -hmm. benefits of robotic process automation? I think I'll, I'll address that issue right now. Um, the typical benefits of robotic automation include reduced cost, uh, increased speed, accuracy, and consistency, improved quality, and scalability of production. Uh, I, I, in, in my first opening remarks, I really address not robotic process automation, which is known as RPA, but robotics in itself. Uh, but robotics process automation is a form of business process automation technology based on uh, a software. So it's kind of like what we call bots, B-O-T-S. Um, and I know that there are a lot of bots out there that are used in, in negative sense. People get uh, spammed with lots of bots uh, in email and things like that. But uh, I think it is what uh, Professor David J. Kelly talked about is that these uh, these uh, the RPA uh, is a, is helps uh, uh, produce, as he gave the example from Amazon, and I gave that earlier, that uh, these processes are here and now and existing. Of course, it's going to develop over time, and I would defer to the others uh, on where that's heading. That's not my background. My background is more to do with um, uh, 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 climate restoration, climate repair, and things like that. But, uh, but we do know that in our technology, so for instance, as an example, we do use some form of robotic processing uh, automation in our pyrolysis systems to help manage the process so that we don't get it off because off by one degree can make a big difference. So um, I think that robotic process automation is something that's here to stay and is, and is an opportunity for, for people out there that are interested in this to, to, to get involved. Uh, so historically, it has benefits. Uh, of course, there are barriers to the adoption of self-service. It's often technological, may not always be feasible or economically viable uh, to retrofit new interfaces onto existing systems. That's one of the problems that people are finding out now. But if it, going forward, I see a huge opportunity in this area, and I think it's going to be the future of development. Thank you, Professor Rock. Uh, there are some important questions. Alea, she wants to know why is robotic process automation the fastest growing enterprise software in the world? So what are the questions you want to respond? You can start off. Yeah, so the, so the uh, yes, number, I guess it is number one. I wasn't aware of that. Thanks for pointing that out. Uh, the the um, um, 
Undoubtedly, the pandemic has had an impact on how people are planning for the future. Uh, the, the, it's, it's had a huge impact on um, remote, so remote uh, conferencing software products like the one we're using right now. Um, but it's also had a lot of people that have factories thinking that they need to more aggressively automate uh, so that they can have a more sustained, uh, more dependable, um, uh, we'll call it a workforce, but but the, so the manufacturing side isn't adversely impacted by pandemics. Uh, and so that means there's a, a lot of interest at the moment in automating. If you, if you can get people out of the critical path when you're building things, uh, you'll still have logistics issues, but but at least the factory can continue to run if you've got materials coming in. Um, we're also, of course, doing things on all aspects of the supply chain at the same time, uh, all pandem pandemic directed. So the, so the pandemic has had a fairly significant impact on the rate in which we're adopting technology. One of them is is um, is autonomous machines and uh, robotic process automation. So that so the uh, so it's not only that they're putting in uh, these increasingly automated lines. Um, they're also uh, making lines intelligent, so they need less oversight. And, um, and so that's going to have an interesting impact uh, on the labor market, because um, if you do fully automate a factory, uh, you take the labor loading down from, you know, one or 2,000 people to 20. So, the, so, the, uh, so there is a significant impact on the, um, on the amount of, of labor force that you need to, to operate an automated plant. It's going to be interesting to see how it works in, in uh, some regions like Germany, where the uh, protections on the workers are absolute. When I toured the um, Mercedes plant in Stuttgart, um, they had a lot of jobs that should have been done by machines that were being done by people. And what they had the machine do is shine lights on what the person should do. So they just followed the moving light to do whatever it is they did, as opposed to having a, a robotic arm do the same thing, incredibly inefficient. Uh, and, I, and I've got to believe it was mind numbing, but, the, but they kept people employed. Um, I, I, I have a feeling that's not sustainable. So the, so the, so in the end, um, the ramp for this is, is at least recently, it, it what likely has an awful lot to do with the pandemic and the need to fully automate uh, these plants to make sure that they can remain running uh, if you've got another pandemic sickness or, uh, or an event that keeps people from coming into work. Thank you, Mr. Adam. Yes, what question you want to respond to? I, uh, I saw the question, is robotic process automation a good career? And it's uh, yes. Mr. Adam, yes, can, can you speak loudly? Like, Oh, sorry. We yeah. still need to get you a new microphone. <laughs> I do, yeah. Well, I've got some new headphones. Just... Yeah. How's that? Testing? A little better, yeah. Okay. Well, Just close. speak up. I'll come a bit closer. Yeah. So, okay, uh, good. Yeah, you're, 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 you're a lot quieter than everybody else. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, is robotic process automation a good career? Uh, yes, it can be. Uh, one of the points about RPA is that, and this applies to all machines and automated systems, is that they can replace much of human labor and do some of the more dangerous and mind-numbing tasks that many people would rather not do. But you would still need people to oversee and manage the systems and be there to make sure everything is working to capacity and quotas are being met. And of course you need uh, uh, security as well and also repair men and repair women to be on standby to repair the machines for when something breaks down or becomes broken or doesn't work properly or is not doing what it is supposed to be doing so that would be a very good career as well as doing research and development into the next generations of these systems and these devices and machines more robust versions and generations and efficient ways to uh, install updates in terms of both hardware and software uh, including ways of applying and installing hard and soft updates without having to stop the whole machine or take the whole machine apart and then consume time doing that and then putting it back together again. So yeah, also increasing smart interfaces and universal connectivity so that engineers could do a task on their smartphone remotely, for instance. So yes, that's my answer to that question. Yes, it can be and it will be. Thank you. Uh, Dr. David Jekali, like, uh, we, we want to learn more from you about research and development on robotic industries, artificial intelligence. Maybe it'll be helpful for our audience. Well, I guess uh, you can break it down into two schools. Uh, you have uh, research related to directly related to industry or research that's academic. Um, when I was at Hall Labs, a lot of that research done at Hall Labs was specific to industry and it included uh, automation 
a lot of automation from uh, factory and warehouse related automation to uh, screen technologies to um, you know interactive environments or or what I would call industrial or architectural digital experiences um, uh, and and then with academic research you you get into abstract areas like uh, artificial general intelligence that's less uh, concrete you know there's not necessarily you don't know if is it even possible and you're trying to figure out this fundamental science uh, uh, behind behind something and I think if if people are looking to make it a career and they're if they're doing it for the money they're better off in the industrial side um, where academic research is is a lot in a lot of cases a, a thankless job that uh, you people do for fun I don't for me the it's it's just you know a, a personal passion um, but I, I could never make a living at a university they just don't pay professors enough to uh, to be practical in, in my opinion what do you think which one is best like academic research or industrial research what is the they're gap? both they're both needed you know it's 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 you don't want one without the other if we're going to make long-term progress we have to do academic research we have to look at the edges of science and and the edges of our capability and try to push the limits at the same time if you're going to translate that stuff into industry you've got to do that industrial research like with hall, hall labs they they did a lot of great research from uh uh, smart homes. I don't. I don't. They. They. You know, toilets there. They could tell you if you have cancer after you go to the bathroom. Uh, you know, all kinds of crazy stuff they they did there. And and you know, well, let's take the toilet for example. The research going into their their toilet. Not Hall Labs. So Hall Labs is a venture capital firm, and they would fund science related companies and one of those was doing these smart toilets and i think they've been released to the market but they're very very expensive still um but um they in developing that they spent 10 years designing that toilet and one of the the developments out of that was the world's smallest mass spectrometer um or you know they they another company they have um, gosh, I can't remember the name of the company, but they they sell the world's slowest microprocessors. They are amazing. Uh, now, why would anyone care about slow microprocessors? Well, that has something to do with the fact that those processors work fine at 800 degrees Fahrenheit and are in lots of popular applications that we can't really talk about or I would get in lots of trouble. Uh, that are government related, but uh, NASA is also a big customer of those chips. Let's, yeah, there you go. Or um, another great technology they had that that was not so much pushing the limits, but just more engineering is. I don't know if you can. Anyway, uh, is there? Uh, they have wireless technology they developed where you could have a device inside a military class three Faraday cage inside a reinforced concrete building that's more than 100 meters in size and then your your another radio on the outside of that and the two could talk via uh, uh signals right through all of that heavy shielding um it's not terribly fast but uh but it, it can be done and those those kinds of where those kinds of research where your um, refining and you're you're building direct application that has a direct effect on specific areas that's where you get into um, uh, that kind of industrial research or, or or and engineering versus academic research which is all you know out on the edges of, of possible um, and that's that's really the difference, you know, and, and you can't really have one without the other. But generally, people focus on one or the other. If you're in academia, 
and or you have some you are able to get some big grants for for some project you can work on this edge case stuff but if you want to um uh in in industry i mean the businesses have to pay, pay the bills you know so they're going to be focused on um that directly applicable sort of industrial research does that make sense mm -hmm. yeah 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 definitely uh mr david J. Kelly, you know that world talent economy forum we are convincing developing world corporations government and academy uh to develop more research develop more uh, innovative project and uh, definitely we have very good response from different corporations and government to involve with world talent economy forum and we are developing our scientific team uh, we want to invite you i know you are super busy but already mr rob mr marshall's adam work as a fellow uh, everybody joining in our team because we need experienced people like you who can guide us who can develop the blueprint uh, example in ai industry so uh, i believe that even after the show we have a uh, largest collaboration with the society of human resource management in asia so so maybe maybe we can contribute more because uh, the difference between developing worlds and developer if you if you give me chance hey sure if you solve yeah. one problem of developing world i say I should focus on research and development because this is the major problem they have. So already many corporations, they are interested to work with World Talent Economy Forum. And we want to invite you in our board, uh, already Mr. Marshall, Professor Rob, and everybody working. So that is the I'm, thing. I'm, I'm interested, but I would want to know more about the responsibilities. You know, what do you need for me? My, my time is fairly constrained and usually when this times like now that we meet i have like mm -hmm. calls all the time my i'm uh you know like 7 a.m to noon pst i'm in meetings um, okay, okay but well, I, uh, we can understand we can understand everybody super busy but we need experienced people like mr rob mr marshall mr uh, yeah, I, I, I would be interested but it, we need to talk about what what it yeah, means definitely um, what kind of commitments you would need thank you thank you mr david Jekyll. mr marshall you are from industry so what are the industrial experience you want to add for to well I, I i i want to follow up on dr david j kelly's uh information he he supplied uh these slow moving chips at 800 degrees centigrade i believe not fahrenheit uh, fahrenheit fahrenheit. Uh, fahrenheit okay so um uh, the, those chips uh, are are usable in in uh, certain types of technologies that we deploy, which are uh, uh, pyrolysis, which is burning in the absence of oxygen, but also our Zajac engine, which uh, is a constant torque, constant pressure, constant temperature engine, the only kind in the world. Uh, it runs at 1425C, but the news is it's protected by this NASA-based technology so that you could actually touch the engine and it wouldn't burn you. You'd feel the heat, and the chips around it would be able to withstand 800 degrees Fahrenheit. So th that's another example of a non-secret technology <laughs> that one could deploy it with and use yeah, it. Yeah, that's true. And, and I think that we, you know, we're seeing more and more of that deployment. So... Uh, more than happy to, to discuss this with the team and it's going to be part of the world talent economy forum that we're going to be talking about and we can talk about how to collaborate so that it doesn't take away from your time um i know the back, ceo if you want to if you want to talk to, to the company right ter terrific uh one of the uh, going back to the topic of today's uh session which is rpa uh, robotic process automation um uh, one of the things that you mentioned and, and Rob mentioned and Adam mentioned was the uh, that it where is it being used per, right now and where is it going? Um, well, I, I, I'm not sure everybody is aware of it. I, I was a an executive at Chase um, and in, in the Western Hemisphere section many years ago. And believe it or not, we developed a, a software application called Titan. And Titan used a form of robot process automation back then it was an early form of it and uh so it's it, it today it's since developed back then from the 80s until now so the banking and finance process automation uh, uses rpa uh customer care automation uses it uh e-commerce merchandising operations use it uh optical care recognition applications use it 
data extraction processes use it at under the current capabilities and there's also a uh, automation process in manufacturing known as fixed automation if you're familiar with that but uh, th i think one of the key questions is what is the impact on society and there's been a lot of studies done on, on it and um uh, there's uh, Oxford University conjectures that up to 35% of all jobs might be automated by 2035. That's a lot of jobs. What happens to those people? Well, uh, the, the, I think there's a, an indication that they're not just looking at those 35%, but they're saying, what happens to that talent? What do we do with that talent and how do we repurpose it? And, and it, it's my contention that that talent that would be repurposed by robotic automation process has other opportunities for job training, but not only job creation, job deployment through the climate crisis. The climate crisis is a big existential threat. It's here and now, and uh, we need we need more people as well as automated process. Um, obviously, uh, RPA has a business process outsource from out, uh, offshore locations to data, data centers. It, it tends to benefit developed countries as opposed to uh, developing countries and of course it's our mission through the world talent economy forum to help the developing world get to the space where it can be a level playing field with the developed world opportunities and i believe that we can take a threat such as rpa and turn it into an opportunity uh, there was a tedx talk at the university college of london by david moss that explains digital labor in the form of rpa and it's that it would likely revolutionize the cost mode of the services industry by driving the price of products and services down, but while simultaneously improving the quality outcomes, increasing the opportunity for personalization of services. A classic example of that is in healthcare and medicine. So we know that uh, the Japanese business executive, the former CIO of Barclays Bank, uh, noted that digital robots can be a positive effect on society if we start using a robot with empathy to help every person. What did he mean by that? He had a case study of a Japanese insurance company that was able to uh, speed up the process of insurance payouts to the massive past massive disaster incidents. That got money back into people's pockets sooner rather than later. So that's a positive benefit. By the same token, you have a negative benefit by, uh, by taking away people's jobs. But again, my contention is, is there's an opportunity to take the threat, turn it into an opportunity, and actually create more job opportunities by repurposing people and educating them in, in, in the future. I think where this is going is towards unassisted RPA. That's um, RPA AI. It's next generation of RPA-related technologies. Uh, it's technological advances around artificial intelligence, allowing the process to be run on a computer without the need of input from a user. That seems like a threat to people and their jobs. But then again, as Rob pointed out, if people are just sitting around fulfilling something like in Germany and they're not really being that productive, that where the system could make it more productive, we need to repurpose the, 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 the gray cells, as I call it, the, the mindset and the brain power of the humans so that they can be better educated and better opportunities and better pay, by the way, uh, than, than what they're seeing in other parts of the world and not be subsidized but actually create a uh, benefit to humankind and quality of life. So that that's my take for now, Sharif. Thank you. Thank you. I want to go for the concluding remarks for now. Mr. Adam, what's your concluding remarks for today? Yeah. One more day. Yes. Okay. One second. Let's get a bit closer again. <clears throat> well, uh, I just had a few more thoughts about that question you asked me earlier, Sharif, about um, yeah, young people and new generations. and. As we have gone into the 21st century, we have become more aware of physical and mental health, like what helps sustain it and what is unhelpful to the integrity of one's mental and physical health. We know more about life quality, so we have a, a, a fork in the road where we could integrate automation and more automation, or maybe research some uh, psychopharmaceutical interventions and treatments that to sidestep mass unemployment due to automation safeguards against depression and other negative mental effects caused by menial tasks and repetitive laborious jobs or utilize both but I think the latter suggestion involving pharmaceutical drugs would be could be controversial and too reminiscent of stories like Brave New World or 
stories, or should I say cautionary tales, or maybe the positive valence boosting effects of these pharmaceuticals could have positive effects that bolster one's hedonic tone and thus motivation to climb up the job ladder. Uh, or it might be the case that new jobs we haven't yet dreamed of will be created after automation has already been around and integrated in society already for a few years. So. Thank you. Uh, Professor David Smith, thank you for joining today's sessions. So, uh, what's your remarks on robotic process automation? Well, Chief, thank you so much. Sorry, the delay here. Um, you know, robotic process automation to me is one of the areas where we as a society need to come to grasp with the elements in it. We've seen from time to time, we used to use dumb robots to do many things to amplify us. You know, <coughs> if you think about it, a tractor is a dumb robot. You begin to see others like that used too. But we're at the point where we cannot just program robots like you see in a, a factory floor building cars begin to take the tools we provide them, the other elements that are working with it, the rules of our process, the rules of our logistics and others, and have them begin to, within how we've programmed them, make intelligence decisions. And that's the place where I think you're going to see the big paradigm shift moving forward with this. What are the drivers of that? Some things like autonomous driving has dramatically increased our ability to put this type of intelligence into a robotic process automation. Uh, we begin to see advances in things like facial recognition, which has led to tremendous advances in image recognition and have it the whole hectic touch has gone so much advanced in the last few years that a robot can be more sensitive with for example with an egg than most humans can be as you begin to manipulate it like that so this technology curve of advancing these at a really hyperscale rate is what's made some big differences as you look at robotic uh, process automation Thank you. Professor Rob, what's your concluding remarks for today? Well, this is a fascinating area of study. And and, um, and the one question I think I'd like to go back to was, though, is it a good career? Um, the fact is that there are a whole bunch of jobs that um, are available through uh, uh, for robotic process automation. Uh, you've got RPA developer, RPA engineer, RPA technical lead, RPA uh, solution senior developer, and RPA consultant. RPA administrator, RPA business analyst, RPA data, RPA data analyst, RPA project manager, RPA process architect, RPA tester, and RPA support. Um, the, and all of them have very different levels, or at least most have very different levels and types of education. The business an analyst would be somebody with a, with a business and financial background. Uh, data, data analyst would follow uh, what is um, a, um, a data scientist uh, development path. Um, the uh, developer would be a programmer, an engineer would be somebody who would be a mechanical or electrical engineer, uh, technology lead would be a manager. Interesting thing about, by the way, managers and leads and fields like this, often people, it's strangely enough, uh, um, often people do better as managers of groups like this that have uh, a deeper educational background in, um, in uh, uh, human uh, relations and behavioral studies than they necessarily have in the uh, career path. That was actually found in a study that was done inside of Google. Um, the uh, uh, process architect would again have kind of a blend of, of skills. Uh, support would be a, a two-year uh, college. A tester would be a two-year college uh, position. So, that, so, the, uh, so the, the jobs you've got um, range from um, community college level jobs uh, to college jobs to graduate level jobs. Um, and even going all the way up to a PhD level jobs. So, the, so there is a fairly robust uh, development career path in, the, uh, in this field. And, uh, and once you get in it, 
Uh, you kind of have to like rob robots, but the, but the uh, but other than that, uh, it can be a, fa a fascinating area to work. And the uh, and, but it really depends on your on your on your interests and what you do well. Like any job or career choice, uh, you first start off with understanding yourself and what it is you like to do, do and then and then you fit uh, fit the career path to what it is you enjoy. That way, you, you like the work. A, a lot of these jobs can be very long and grueling, particularly if you're setting up lines initially or planning for lines. And if you don't don't enjoy that kind of work, it can be hell. So, uh, so your initial stage, of course, is to determine what it is you like and don't like. And then uh, build your career along those along the lines of things that you enjoy, and that way you're getting paid for things that you would probably like to do, even if you weren't being paid. And that's a great career path. One I found myself in years ago, uh, and um, and it makes a huge difference in work-life balance and personal happiness. So that's probably how I would approach it. Uh, fascinating area. Um, the one problem we've got is um, is uh, the fact that we believe very strongly that that uh, the jobs will result from the transition that will make up for the people that are being laid off. But at least to me, it looks like the jobs that are resulting have very little to do with the jobs that are people that are being laid off, which means that this process will require a substantial amount of retraining. And clearly, if you're in a man manufacturing line job, if you're not also going to night school or doing something else uh, to develop alternative skills, when these things come online, you will be unemployed and you will be unemployable. So, the, so, the, so we live in a world of transition. Uh, learn to like going to school because you'll all be retraining a lot throughout your careers. I I did throughout mine. I think most people do. Um, and if you and if you're open to retraining, uh, you'll never find yourself unemployed or or without a job. You'll you'll pivot with the uh, with the market. But just remember, the biggest skill or best skill you can have going forward is a willingness to accept change and plan for it. Thank you, Professor Rob. Professor David Jekali, what's your concluding remarks for today? Well, I. Uh... I want to pivot off of what was just said. You know, it as society evolves, <clears throat> it it really is um, about being able to 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 adapt to change, to learn as as a as as a lifestyle choice. You know, you, even like right now as a software engineer, you pretty much got to retool all of your core skills every two years, or fade away into into obscurity uh and i think more and more careers are going to be like that i don't think people should be afraid of the change you know the more automation the better you know but factory workers and, and people like that are are going to have the hardest time to to uh uh transition you know because they're they're a lot of like like he said a lot of jobs are not are they don't translate well into the new economy or the new new environment you know you're going to have to get totally different skills and learn different things but it's it's not like there's no opportunity there's still going to be lots of i mean the people are still here and people will create jobs but they'll be different ones doing different things and even when we start getting into really high-end artificial general intelligence that can compete with humans almost on every level you still have ways of utilizing though that human resource there will be jobs there will be difficult transitions but being in that mindset that you're always learning you're always trying to you know evolve who you are and your skills and that kind of stuff that's really where your long-term success is as as a career in in my opinion thank you so marshall what's your concluding remarks for today well um i'll leave to uh uh david smith to talk he typically talks about the the marketplace for uh, robotic process automation and where it's at and where it's heading i'll leave that to him uh, i i i would say that I, and i i'm going to just follow up on what D professor david j kelly said and rob said is that um yes job job uh jobs are going to be lost yes they're not going to be replaced in the same category and the people have to be retrained but that's been that's been the history of automation and innovation since the invention of the automobile and um uh, process engineers that were replaced had to learn other skill sets but a lot of the people that already have some basic skill sets uh, in mathematics in logistics, in other things, 
can be used and deployed, especially in my experience with the, uh, the climate crisis. The climate crisis is an existential threat and it needs all hands on deck. So will we be able to take some of those people people and retrain them? Absolutely. Will some of them be trainable and uh, not trainable? That's probably likely to occur. So we have to find a fit. But there are people out there. That's what they do for a living. They, they find uh, they retrain people for new careers. And it's happening all the time. It's been happening since the early 1900s. Uh, and it's and of course, with the advent of the automation process and bots, it's actually happening at an exponential process. Uh, at, at speed, that is, an exponential speed. But I do agree that the opportunity is there, and I do agree that uh, people uh, are not going to be denied the fact that this is there. And as I gave the example before, it can be used in healthcare to get to, to be a benefit. It can also be used as a, a detriment. It could be used uh, in warfare, uh, and uh, that's that's not a good thing. But the point is, is I think that we need to uh, embrace. RPA and understand how it works best for humanity. And, and, and it, it can definitely be used to help us uh, mitigate the problems of, of the climate crisis, but at the same time, create good quality jobs and retrain people and get them paid while they're being retrained, by the way. I think that's a function of organizations such as the World Talent Economy Forum is to create training and education opportunities for people. And if we can do that, we're all better off. So that's that's my two cents. Thank you, Mr. Marshall. Professor David Smith, what's your concluding remarks for today? The, the comments of being able to be retrained and everything, I, I love where that is headed because actually adding robotics and robotic processes into the mix is going to create a number of new jobs. There are different jobs than they were before, less physical, uh, using more of our intellect and things where we should excel. And it's not just in software. I mean, mathematics is going to be very important. Things, like I said before, with visual programming, visual recognition, how we do touch. Touch is a big part of the next generation of robots. Uh, you know, uh, and, and I can see it coming more than we expect. Uh, I, I this week was reminded that the Jetsons television series is 40 years in the future from where we are today, how it was placed with the robots, the flying cars and everything on that. What's interesting is when you look at the Jetsons, we can do almost everything in that today. And we see that happening. Uh, Robots, I welcome. I mean, to me, it's like when we begin using uh, steel and iron to, to uh, farm, where we went from using sticks and stones to farm. We're at the point where we're beginning to take our ability to have machines substitute for human la labor to a next plateau. Now, we have to be intelligent as we do it, particularly using... AI tools that are more cognizant of what we're doing. We need to get uh, the ability to have it stay in control in place. But I think robotics and pr process is going to be a very important future. It's really here today, and we're just seeing the advancements go on a reasonably steep uh, learning curve. So, Sharif, sorry for the delay here. Uh, Miami is a strange town trying to get connected and everything. Thank you. Thank you for joining today's session. Thank you, everyone, for joining today's session. Robotic process automation is very important. Even this COVID-19 situation, we can understand. We need to automate our industries and many things, even though in Malaysia, uh, we are observing they need more manpower right now. So if they can implement this automation and automated process and human and robotics, already even in Malaysia, robots and human working together in restaurant so if we work together in the restaurants in the manufacturing industry i believe we can develop more efficiency and more effectiveness so thank you everyone for joining today's sessions i want to declare our this is our 514 episode so what is our achievement in between 514 episode actually we achieve many excellent people in our talent economy uh, those who are very very knowledgeable person uh, as well as 
their uh, professional support uh, to the people, to the corporations, to the World Talent Economy Forums actually uh, very important for us. So we are decla declaring 14 members. Uh, I just want to share that, Mr. Adam, you are our fellow. So we need a very, very good support from you. And especially we need a lot of fellow because all of the professionals, those who join in our central organizations, like they will lead the organization. They are super busy. But the fellow, they will implement the idea. They will implement the blueprint. So we need more fellows uh, from you already. Uh, many fellows joining, maybe we can synchronize the team. So I want to declare a few names. Dr. Tali Rafael, uh, all of them actually part of our committee, the scientific committee, Dr. Fred Philip, Dr. Adrian David Chiok, uh, Mr. David Smith, Mr. Donald, uh, Mr. Rob Enderly, David Schumacher, Mr. Gennady, Mr. Marshall, Mr. Iskanders, Humaira Tanzila. Uh, she is actually supporting uh, us a lot from the uh, back ends. Uh, Mr. Maskawat, uh, David J. Kelly. Uh, actually, he will discuss later uh, based on his available time and everything. But we want to invite you in our board, Mr. Tom Rose. Uh, we have few other friends, uh, Mr. Home Stoners. Uh, Mr. Paul from Good News, those who also supporting us a lot in World Talent Economy Forum. And beside that, we are involving with government, corporations, academy, NGOs, uh, as much as possible, and specifically many grassroots level, still there are uh, the largest corporations or, or, uh, or they cannot engage with them. So we are trying to engage with many peoples and uh, not only people, every country has different, different problems. Maybe our board, uh, I, I, I have a strong feelings that our board, our um, main core team, they have ability to solve many problems. So if you have any uh, complex issues, you can share with us. Let's say Mr. Marshall already solving this waste management related problem in Malaysia. Already he's working with Malaysian team. Uh, Mr. Rob Enderley is a very good in consultancy. Mr. David Smith, I find you you are excellent in startup ecosystem development. And Mr. David Jekali, I'm a big fan of you for your AI-related knowledge and your contributions. So uh, we have a very strong team. I believe they can solve many complex problems of the developing world, specifically in Asia. Uh, I want to share that 40% of the populations around the world, they live in Asia Pacific. Uh, yes, we have a very good infrastructure, but still, for the developing world, we have to work hard. So if we collaborate like in between developed world and the developing worlds, maybe we can solve many problems and we can make a better world. So thank you everyone for your continuous support. And another good news like next year, February in India, we are launching our first, uh, definitely it will be hybrid. Those who want to join in online, they can join in online. And those who want to join in uh, offline, they can, they can come to India. We are launching Nikola Tesla Technologies uh, uh, conference. Those who want to arrange more conference with us with different topic. I, I believe that we are very much interested about startup. We are very much interested about artificial intelligence and robotics. Uh, we are interested about climate change. We are in, interested about uh, corporate strategy development. So the board, if you have any proposal, you can share with us. With our fellow, we will implement it. So thank you, Professor Rob, Professor David Jekali, Professor David Smith, Mr. Marshall, and Mr. Adam for your continuous support for World Talent Economy Forum. Let's involve with the real project. Let's involve with the real people and uh, rebuild this new world. Thank you. Bye-bye and take care. Bye, everyone. Bye, everyone.